Are you or someone in your family having memory problems or suffering from dementia? If you do your research, you'll find dozens if not hundreds of reasons for dementia and ways to avoid it. In this video, I'm going to reveal 10 common and uncommon items that are known to worsen dementia and memory loss. I guarantee there will be a few that you will be surprised to hear about. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Park, an ENT surgeon and sleep medicine doctor. You may be asking what an ENT doctor is doing talking about dementia. You see, treating sleep apnea is a major part of the field of ENT, or otolaryngology. One of the most commonly known complications of untreated sleep apnea is dementia. But as a sleep doctor, we know that poor sleep in general also affects how well your brain works. And as a holistic and integrated physician, I know that it's important to address your entire body and your environment, as well as your emotional and psychological state of mind, so that you can be truly healthy as well as to thrive in your life. Just a reminder that if you find this video helpful, please hit the thumbs up like button as well as subscribe to my channel. This will help my videos reach a lot more people to help with their sleep and health problems. Honestly, I was shocked when I saw how many different reasons there are that can potentially cause memory loss or dementia. And as I do more research in general, not only for dementia but all other areas of medicine, it's becoming clear that your genes are less and less responsible for chronic diseases and that your environment is more important. This brings up the concept of epigenetics where your environment affects how your genes are expressed. And there's never only one reason for dementia, as is the same for other medical conditions. Now, I'm going to use the term dementia very loosely in this video. It can mean anything from memory loss to poor cognitive function, all the way up to vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And I think it's safe to say that for the most part, the longer and more intensely you've been exposed to various risk factors, the more likely you'll be at risk for dementia and your genes are only one of many other risk factors. In this video, I'm going to cover 10 specific items or categories. I have to admit, there's so many others, but I'm listing the most common things with published studies that you have some or complete control over. The first one is sleep. You know how it feels and how poorly your brain works if you don't sleep well. This is a study looking at about 8,000 middle-aged people who have followed for up to 25 years. Those who slept for less than 6 hours compared to those who slept for 7 or more hours had a 30% higher risk of developing dementia. This was independent of socioeconomic, behavioral, cardiometabolic, and mental health factors. I'm guessing that many of you watching this video sleep less than 6 hours on average every night, right? You know what you have to do, so commit yourself now to going to bed 1 hour earlier, starting tonight. Now for sleep apnea and dementia, I've talked about this in detail in my past material as well as on the video this past May. Here's a quick review. We already know that people with untreated sleep apnea have much higher rates of mild cognitive impairment or dementia. It's not surprising that lots of episodes of low oxygen can cause some major damage to your brain. This prospective study from Taiwan looking at about 1,400 subjects found that after 5 years, people with sleep apnea had a 70% higher risk of developing dementia compared to those without sleep apnea. On the flip side, this meta-analysis found that people with Alzheimer's disease had about a 5 times or 500% higher risk of having sleep apnea. The good news is that treating sleep apnea at either the pre-dementia or dementia stages were found to help delay the progression of or to dementia. This concept was proven by this study showing that subjects with sleep disordered breathing had much earlier mild cognitive impairment or dementia onset by 9 to 10 years, but in certain subsets, treatment with CPAP delayed cognitive impairment by 10 years. And here's a systematic review and meta-analysis showing that patients with sleep apnea had a 43% increased risk of developing a neurocognitive disorder, 28% higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, and 54% higher risk of Parkinson's disease. They even mentioned that one study found a 2 times higher risk of Lewy body dementia. This is why it's so important to treat your sleep apnea, especially if it's severe. In case you're asking if your memory will get better with CPAP, the answer is yes. After 3 months of CPAP in patients with severe sleep apnea, there was significant regrowth of damaged brain tissue in the frontal and hippocampal areas with improvements in memory, attention, and executive function. Your brain makes up only 2% of body weight but uses up 20% of all the energy. So imagine if you're constantly depriving your brain of oxygen at night, which dips repeatedly into the 70% range 20-40 to 40 times every hour. I've even seen oxygen levels drop into the 50s or 60s. It's no wonder that people with severe sleep apnea have various levels of dead brain cells. And we know that about 20% of the US population has obstructive sleep apnea, of which 80% are not diagnosed. 
So this is a serious issue that needs to be addressed, especially if you have one or more of the other risk factors I'm going to talk about in this video. Number two is obesity, or what comes along with obesity, which is diabetes, also part of the metabolic syndrome. It's been said that Alzheimer's disease or dementia is type 3 diabetes, where your brain tissue is damaged due to the ravages of diabetes and insulin resistance. I won't get into the details too much about why we have an epidemic of obesity and insulin resistance in this country since it's a huge and controversial topic. Let me just say that the American public and the food industry has followed the nutritional guidelines set by the USDA and other governmental agencies and promoted by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics along with various patient advocacy groups. Now, as a result of following these guidelines, are we any healthier? Absolutely not. In fact, as a country, we are now much sicker and fatter, ranking near the bottom of all health measures and worse than some third world countries. Here's a chart showing that we spend twice the amount in healthcare per capita for wealthy countries, but our life expectancy is at the bottom by far. We also have lots of evidence showing that people with metabolic syndrome have higher rates of brain damage. This study from Italy in 2019 found that metabolic syndrome was associated with higher rates of myocognitive impairment and vascular dementia. And here's a scary study from 2018 where they looked at data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey and found that only 20% of Americans were metabolically healthy. And less than one third of normal weight people were metabolically healthy. In 2020, about 42% of adults were obese and 74% total were either obese or overweight. These are frightening numbers. One last comment about obesity and diabetes. Metabolic syndrome is a mixture of high blood sugar, low HDL, high triglycerides, large waist circumference, and high blood pressure. It's also not too surprising that people with metabolic syndrome are more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea. One study found that 66% of people with metabolic syndrome have sleep apnea. The higher the severity of the sleep apnea, the worse the markers of metabolic syndrome. Number three is certain medications. This would be a very broad overview since there are so many kinds of prescription and over-the-counter medications that have the potential to cause memory impairment or dementia if used long-term. The most obvious medications are any that have anticholinergic properties. Your brain needs acetylcholine to function properly, as well as to signal to your salivary, digestive, or reproductive organs. So blocking acetylcholine will impair these organs, especially your brain. The most common class of medications include the first-generation antihistamines such as diphenhydramine or Benadryl, or any of the over-the-counter cold remedies that have one of these older antihistamines. Anything with the word PM will have a sedating antihistamine. Also, any of the anti-nausea or anti-vertigo medications can also potentially have anticholinergic properties. The newer antihistamines such as the brand names Claritin, Allegra, or Zyrtec are not as bad, but not completely harmless either. Other commonly prescribed medications are those that are given for overactive bladder, muscle relaxants such as Flexerol, tricyclic antidepressants, and one particular type of SSRI antidepressant called paroxetine or Paxil. I'll place a link below to a more comprehensive chart of various anticholinergic medications. Other medications with increased risk of dementia include proton pump inhibitors for acid reflux such as Prilosec, benzodiazepines such as Valium, and sleeping pills such as Ambien, and high levels of opioid use. For cholesterol-lowering medications, only the lipophilic types or those that are attracted to fat actually double the risk of developing dementia after 8 years compared to non-fat-loving statins. These fat-soluble statins include the brand names Lipitor, Zocor, and Autoprev. Memory loss is a well-documented side effect of statins, but maybe it's only from certain statins. Number 4 is low vitamin D. I've talked extensively about all the other health benefits of vitamin D, which is really a hormone. This is a prospective study of over 12,000 people who were given vitamin D supplementation and those who didn't get any. They looked at dementia-free survival, and here's the image from the study. What they found was that with vitamin D supplementation, after 10 years, they had a 40% lower rate of dementia. As you can see, this is pretty significant. Number 5 is fluoride. You're probably most familiar with fluoride that's in your toothpaste and your water, but what I'm going to tell you is very disturbing. The main source of fluoride that you ingest is in your drinking water, and in most cases it's not sodium fluoride, but fluorosilicic acid, which is a toxic waste product from phosphate fertilizer and aluminum mines. You can find more information in the first few pages of the executive summary of the fluoride toxicology report that you can find in the link below. I'll also place a link to an interesting read called Toxic Treatment, 
Fluoride's Transformation from Industrial Waste to Public Health Miracle. So here's a meta-analysis showing that having high levels of fluoride in drinking water was associated with 48% lower IQ scores in children. And even low to moderate levels of fluoride exposure was found to lower thyroid function. They calculated that for every 1 mg per liter increment of fluoride in the water, there was a 0.13 increment increase in thyroid stimulating hormone, which is elevated in response to low body thyroid levels. I realize these studies are done in children, but the effects of slow fluoride poisoning can last a lifetime. There are also reports of pineal gland calcification due to lifelong fluoride exposure. This will lead to lower levels of the sleep hormone melatonin, leading to a long list of other various bad health outcomes. One additional comment about fluoride is that it's found in many prescription medications. Fluoroquinolones, which include Cipro, are commonly prescribed. Note that fluoroquinolones have a serious black box warning from the FDA about aortic artery dissection and Achilles tendon rupture risk. As can be expected, this is a highly charged topic, so you should do your own research. As always, follow the money. In this case, in the middle of the 1900s when they added fluoride to the water supply to fight cavities, the money promoting this came mostly from the aluminum and sugar industries. I added a helpful link below called Prescription Drugs That Contain Fluoride, which also has ways to limit fluoride exposure. Number six is aluminum. I'm sure you're already very familiar with the link between aluminum and Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, it seems like modern society is inundated with aluminum all over the place. Small amounts are found in our environment and our food supply, personal care products, and pharmaceuticals including over-the-counter drugs as well as in our vaccines. The good news is that aluminum is poorly absorbed, but once absorbed, or if it's infused or injected, it's associated with several conditions such as bone disorders, kidney damage, hormonal imbalances, and cancers, in addition to dementia. Rather than giving you a long list of steps, I strongly recommend looking at Dr. Ann Shippey's great article on how to reduce aluminum exposure. The link can be found below. Number seven is mercury. It's one of the most toxic substances known to man. Believe it or not, mercury was commonly prescribed by doctors for a variety of ailments in the 1800s up to the early part of the 1900s. Babies were commonly given a mercury-based powder for teething with many reports of paralysis. And dental fillings with mercury began to be used in the 1800s. Mercury cyanide was used as a treatment for conjunctivitis until the 1950s. And in the 1950s, organic mercury in the form of thimerosal was added to vaccines to create a more robust immune response. And here's a systematic review in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease showing that there may be a causal relationship between mercury and dementia. Here's a diagram from that study describing the proposed steps on how mercury promotes amyloid plaque buildup in the brain. Needless to say, we should try to avoid mercury as much as possible. Number eight is head trauma. I think you're likely convinced already that repeated blows to the head over a long period of time are not good for your brain. But here's something to think about. If you already have sleep apnea, then the results of traumatic brain injury are much worse. A 2009 study from the Mayo Clinic found that 46% of 52 randomly chosen NFL players and 60% of linemen had significant sleep apnea. This isn't surprising since they're not only muscular but also overweight, especially the linemen. So it's not too far-fetched to see that if you have sleep apnea, suffering from traumatic brain injury can lead to worse dementia. Number nine is the lack of social networks and relationships. This one's not surprising. Dementia is not only about our genes, habits, or toxins. Your relationships and quality time with friends and loved ones are just as important as some of the other risk factors mentioned in this video. Honestly, I was shocked at how many studies there are showing that loneliness and lack of social relationships resulted in much higher rates of dementia later in life. This systematic review of long-term prospective studies found that people with low social participation or contact or loneliness had higher rates of new onset dementia. It ranged from about 41 to 58 percent higher than those who had good social networks. And this study found around twice the rate of dementia seen in the clinical dementia rating scale as well as the middle mental status exam. You can also see higher tenure death rates as well as much higher rates of being hospitalized after 10 years. And number 10, surprisingly for me, is anesthesia. This study found that exposure to surgery with anesthesia was a risk factor for dementia at 2.23 times higher the risk. Specifically, higher risk was found only for exposure to inhaled gases that were halogenated, such as halothane, isoflurane, or sevoflurane. There's been a lot written about the common observation of cognitive decline for weeks to months after longer procedures, particularly in older people. 
Various studies looking at the link between anesthesia and dementia are mixed, with a recent meta-analysis showing possible mildly increased risk. This topic is a big one, with lots of rabbit holes as I do more research about this. So I'll go over this specific topic in much more detail in another video. So here's a quick summary of how to lower your risk of dementia. Number one, treat any sleep apnea if you have it. Remember that even if you're skinny or don't snore, you can still have sleep apnea. Number two, lose weight. We know that excess weight is linked to diabetes and metabolic syndrome, and poor sleep makes it more difficult to lose weight. Number three, avoid medications as much as possible in general, including over-the-counter medications, particularly the ones that I listed before. And you can find the link below. Number four, set up air and water filtration at home to remove toxins in your house, especially fluoride, which can be removed only with a reverse osmosis filter. Indoor plants are also great for cleaning indoor pollutants. Number five, think about how much exposure you have to all the various common toxic metals such as mercury, aluminum, and lead. It's not just in your environment, but also in your food. That's why it's important to eat as organically as possible. Number six, get rid of clutter. Clutter makes more dust and creates more toxic debris. Number seven, try to avoid traumatizing your head repeatedly for any reason, even much more important if you have untreated sleep apnea. Number eight, work on fostering better relationships with loved ones and friends and stay connected to other people in live settings, not on social media. And address any feelings of anger, resentment, or anxiety due to past traumatic experiences, all of which can raise your stress levels. Studies have shown that psychological and or emotional stress can raise your risk of developing dementia by 10 to 60 percent. Number nine, make sure your vitamin D levels are above 50. And lastly, going along with the previous theme of minimizing medications, do everything to try to avoid general anesthesia. Obviously, you can't avoid emergencies, such as if you're in an accident. However, most surgical procedures that need general anesthesia are a consequence of unhealthy, lifelong habits. This is something that you do have control over. In an upcoming video, I'll go into much more detail about my take on surgical anesthetic gases and how they can potentially affect your brain in negative ways. Again, if you found this information helpful, please click the thumbs up and subscribe buttons and leave your comments below. If you or your loved one has memory problems or dementia, what do you think was the biggest risk factor? I'd like to know. Until next time, this is Dr. Stephen Park.